Welcome. Uh, we we bought a condo, but we just got in this uh, this weekend, and uh, it's furnished and it's got all this art. So you guys are all used to me just having my white wall as a background. Thought I'd mix it up for you guys. Um, it was hard to find a, a spot that would work. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, pretty fun. Um, so I'm here in town, but at home. <laughs> um, and you guys get to enjoy this art. Don't be distracted. Um, that's kind of boring. Anyways, so kind of fun. Um, okay, so I, I decided on, on the textbook and I, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I didn't pick it, but it works. Um, I'm looking at another Goldie painting over there, so maybe I'll mix it up for next day. Um, no promises though. Uh, okay, so I, uh, I decided, or I, I had already decided on a textbook and I wanted to, uh, so it's hosted by the library. And so it's a, it's a free access uh, textbook. And I posted the link and I couldn't get it to log me in. So uh, I don't know what that's all about. I sent an email, I haven't heard back. Um, and so, but I, I want to show you where I posted it. And so on our Moodle page, let's see if I can just take a screenshot here. And maybe I'll, I don't need all that blank space there, but So I posted this textbook uh, and just as a note, it's the second edition. Okay, should be obvious once we're able to log in there. Uh, but what I'm finding is, and maybe it's because I'm not on campus or something like that, but you should be able to log in uh, anyways. So when I hit it, I get to this. So I, I've sent an email and I've asked, you know, how do we log in to EBSCO? And, and maybe you guys already know, I don't know. Um, but I, my usual login wasn't working. And so now I'm kind of like, I don't know what to, what to try. So I'm still waiting on, on information. Um, it, but you'll be able to access the textbook this way. Okay. And it is the one that goes through and, and shows you the R code as well as the Python code. Remember, we're gonna use this as our safe space for learning Python, uh, or at least kind of getting familiar with Python, okay? So, um, so that's supposed to be set up. It's not uh, kind of classic. All right, so, uh, Let's see if I can kind of bump this over a bit more here. Okay, and so um, a link to the textbook is posted. Hey, I wonder, why did I cut it off so early? Is posted on Moodle. Okay, uh, and let me know if, if you're able to, to get in there. It should have a crab on the front, um, or maybe it doesn't go to the front page. I don't know, I don't know how it's gonna look. So anyways, uh, because I, I haven't been able to crack, hack my way in, let's say. Okay, so uh, a link to the textbook is posted on Moodle. Uh, it's free from the library. 
Um, but still waiting to hear back. I shouldn't say, oh, I'm still waiting. I sent him an email this morning and he hasn't replied. So, so it's not, uh, it's not really his fault. It's my fault. But anyway, still waiting to hear back about login instructions. Okay, but um, once I have them, I'll, I'll put them below that link. Okay, you can purchase the textbook. So kind of a uh, appropriate. Um, Okay, so uh, I just got a direct message here, but you can log in with the institutional login. What do you think that is? I tried mine, but it wouldn't. I'm glad you're, it sounds like someone was able to log in, so that's good. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing the login instructions to everyone, I think that would be Great. Uh, oh, let's see here. By choosing Okanagan College. Okay. Uh, login again, maybe. Institutional login. Select your region or group. Oh. Okay. Ah, Canada School of Nope. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> you guys will be faster because I'm just on my LMNOP. And then, oh, Canadian College. Fun. You hacked it. You did it. Okay, so I'm going to hit Okanagan College. And then what? Okay. Okay. I didn't read it. I'm going to just consent and then continue. Okay. And now Do I have to search for my, this seems really uh, roundabout. All right, practical statistics. It should come up for data scientists. That's us, or that's you guys, I guess. Search. I wanted just a link for the textbook. Maybe it'll come up now. Okay. Uh, okay, so I want this uh, second edition. Okay, so these first two are what, what the textbook looks like. Uh, they've changed the crab a little bit. So it's, uh, I think, black and white or something, but, um, or the cover or something, but make sure that you have the second edition. And click here to access. Man, that's a roundabout way of doing it. I'll see if I can streamline that a little bit. I guess you'll get good at it, but and probably just keep it open. But um, so here it is. Oh, they made the crab colored, not black and white. That was the thing. Okay. And so it should look like this. And uh, kind of fun. So I'm not sure how it would only take us nine hours and 16 minutes to complete this. There's like almost 400 pages, but okay. Uh, so I don't know if that is real, but, uh, but this is the, the textbook that we're going to be using. Now, I wasn't sure if we'd have it set up today. So I wanted to just do uh, just, I wanted to do some 
a simple linear regression review just to kind of brush off those skills from STAT 230. And then uh, for next day, we'll start digging into this textbook. Okay, so I wanted to make sure that it's um, all set up first, which it seems to be, but kind of difficult. Okay, so let's see if I can recreate the magic here. Um, click institutional login, find Okanagan College, click agree, right? Uh, enter, agree, etc. Search for the textbook. Click the second edition. Which doesn't have a cover showing. No cover uh, showing in the thumbnails. Okay, it has to be the second edition because that's when they introduced Python. So in the first edition, I was looking at the first edition and, uh, you know, they would say stuff like, oh, and then in Python, you would do this. Uh, and But they wouldn't actually show you. So it's the second edition. Second edition introduces Python. So that's the one that you want. Okay. And so you can also buy it uh, on Amazon. You can buy a print copy if you want. Uh, but this one is free, right? And so that's it's free. So the library version is, of course, free. Is free. Um, but if you're buying it on Amazon, uh, but you can also purchase a print copy. Probably on Amazon. I mean, you could probably find it. I did not bring it into the bookstore because they get really mad when people don't buy stuff that if you order it. So, um, I, and I just decided on it. So, uh, but if you would like me to order a, a stack of print copies, I can do that. Um, let me see if I can. Amazon. Let's, oh, search. No. Uh, oh, practice. Statistics. Oops. It might just do it for data scientists. So it's a, a seemingly pretty common book. Make sure it's the second edition here. Okay. So let me just copy this here. So pretty reasonable print copy if you wanted one. I know I'm old school, so I, I like to have a print copy. Um, I try to be cool like other people, but honestly, um, make sure it's the using R and Python, whereas the first edition doesn't use Python. Okay. And so uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Yeah, I try to be all cool and use the PDF and then I eventually I'll cave and, and buy a print copy. But what's really nice is, you know, they're not they're not insane in terms of textbooks. So nice to have. OK, so uh, and if you would if you would prefer that I order a bunch, then you can buy them from me. I guess that seems weird. Um, but I can order them to the school if you have trouble with deliveries and stuff like that. So anyways, um, a lot of you aren't here, so that might be difficult. Anyways, I'll let you order your own if you want it. You don't have to. Uh, but I think I'm going to order one. 
because I'm old. Anyways, so you've got options, okay? Um, just really make sure that it's the second edition. Okay? I cannot emphasize that enough. Otherwise, it's all moot. The reason we're using it is because it, it introduces R code and Python code, and it only does that in the second edition. Okay, so um, but you should be able to access. There should be unlimited uh, uh, access points to the the library one, but if you run into trouble, then let me know. Okay, great. Uh, phew. I think that's that's all I can say about the textbook. So uh, definitely flip through the textbook. We're gonna kind of hold off on on getting too into it today because I just introduced it, right? But flip through the textbook and the and the first um, off the top of my head, I can't remember if it's the first chapter or the first section. I can't remember how long they are, but um, Browse the uh, the first section slash chapter for next day. Yeah. Just kind of browse it. Uh, none of it should be new, right? Because a lot of it is just laying the groundwork for statistics, which you already kind of have. But now we're going at it from a different angle where we're introducing a lot more coding, a lot more R, definitely R, but also a little bit of Python. How about that? Try to do as much as I can. I'm scared. No, it'll be fun. I was talking to my, my coworkers and I was like, oh yeah. And then uh, I don't know what got into me. I just decided that we were gonna do Python. Wouldn't that be fun? And everyone was like, oh, well, do you know Python? And I said, not yet, I will. So it's the only way to do it, I think. Just jump right in. My sister got a, got a standard car. She didn't know how to drive standard. She just decided she wanted to learn. And so she bought a standard car. Anyways, <laughs> pretty weird. Um, okay, so <laughs> yeah. Party time. Um, okay, so uh, let's see here. How can I make this a little bit smaller? All right. So um, last day we did uh, a brief but thorough review of how can something be brief and thorough? I don't know, it just was, uh, right? It was a broad overview of hypothesis testing, okay? And what I wanna do is I just wanna go back over um, simple linear regression and then that's where we're gonna pick up, okay? And so, um, so today we're gonna do STAT 230 review Uh, of simple linear regression. <clears throat> so uh, let's talk about, okay, how do we start a regression question? What's the purpose of regression, right? And so regression is uh, when we consider the relationship between two variables. Um, the response variable is numerical uh, and the uh, explanatory variable is allowed to be numerical or categorical. Often it's numerical, but it can't, it is allowed to be categorical. Okay, and so regression, just in general, is uh, considering the relationship Considering the relationship between two variables, okay, 
the response variable. Uh oh, if these aren't, if this terminology isn't ringing a bell, you might have to go back and and review some stuff. But the response variable, right, is on the y-axis. And it's also the variable that we're interested in, right? So the response variable is the variable of interest. <clears throat> okay, so the response variable has to be numerical for regression. Okay, now uh, we in this course, we're going to talk about, okay, what happens if the response variable is categorical? Okay, then, then what do we do? Then we're trying to classify what category something would be in, right? We're trying to predict what category things would be in. Whereas for a numerical response, we're just trying to predict what the value would be given some input numbers. Okay. And so we will talk about uh, a categorical outcome, but in terms of STAT 230 and the review from STAT 230, we have only considered numerical responses so far. But just know that we can talk about categorical variables as the response as well, and we will. Okay. So then the response variable is on the y-axis and it has to be numerical. Okay. I'm going to highlight that. Whereas the explanatory variable is on the x-axis and it can be either numerical or categorical. Okay. Either numerical or categorical. but often, often it is just numerical. Okay. Uh, but most commonly it is numerical. Okay. Especially in, in SAT 230, we only talked about numerical variables but just know that it's allowed to be categorical, okay? And so what I want you to kind of step back, to step back and think about is, okay, so now if you have a data set and depending on what type of variable your response variable is, that's gonna determine what path you take in terms of your analyses, right? Can I do a regression analysis because I have a numerical response variable or should I be doing a logistic regression because I have a categorical response variable, right? I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's, it's exciting to get to take you, to, take you guys down this road. Uh, but for now, let's focus on numerical response variables uh, because that's what we've seen so far. And I did promise a, a review, <laughs> but I just get so excited anyways. So just know that that's, that's coming up and that that can happen. Uh, but for now, let's focus on numerical response variables. Okay. Now, the purpose, the purpose of regression is to be able to predict um, future values. Okay. So the purpose of regression is to be able, and maybe I want to just, is to model the relationship. I'm going to start introducing that terminology. And it's hard for me because I'm coming, uh, I teach STAT 230, a different section of STAT 230 right before this. And so there I'm trying to not use these kind of trigger words, but now I want to use the words like modeling and and stuff like that, just so we get in the habit of using them. So the purpose of regression, that's for me, just to kind of change gears here. The purpose of regression is to model the relationship in 
in order to predict future values. In order to predict future values. Now, I'm going to put quotes around future because I'm not talking about uh, on a timeline. We're, we will talk about time series, but that's a special type of analysis, okay? So time series is when we have time on the x-axis, okay? Uh, and we didn't talk about that really. I said it just as much as I just did. It's when you have time on the x-axis, but that's it. Okay, so we're gonna introduce that later. But what I mean in this case about future values is I mean values that we haven't seen yet, right? So they're still in that same realm, but it's just inputs that we haven't seen before. Okay, so not in terms of time, but rather, but rather um, predicting the output using inputs that are not in our data. Okay. Predicting outputs. So why? Okay, so predicting outputs using uh, inputs, which is your X, that we haven't seen in our data, that we haven't necessarily seen in our data, that we haven't seen in our data. Okay. But what we say is that these inputs, they should be in the same realm of our current data. Right? Recall, um, our inputs for prediction should still come from the range of our data, right? So, so kind of the, uh, the possible values of X that we already have. Otherwise we are extrapolating, right? Predicting beyond the range of our data. Okay, and that's bad because it makes our predictions unreliable, right? We don't know what happens beyond this range. We know very well, or we feel really good about what's happening within the range of our data. But then if we go beyond that in either direction, we can, because what we're using is a straight line model and a straight line does go across infinity to negative infinity, right? So it does go there, you can use that line, but we should only use it for the range of our data that we built it on, okay? So recall our inputs for prediction. Uh, <clears throat> must be within the range of our data that we built our model on or built our model using. Okay. Otherwise, we are extrapolating We are extrapolating, which is when we're predicting, and I'll, so I'll put it in brackets here, predicting beyond the range of our data. Yeah. Now, it gets a little confusing, right? Because here, range, I really just mean kind of the, the spread of our X's, okay? So if you're familiar with other math, right? The range, typically we use the range to denote the, the spread of the Y's. But in this case, when I say range, uh, the range of our data is actually referring to the X values, okay? 
So uh, the spread or beyond the um, plausible values of X Okay, that's what I mean there. A little bit tricky. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So what happens if we're extrapolating? Sometimes there are cases, and this is going to happen a lot, right? When we talk about our analyses, there's always going to be these rare instances where, okay, well, sometimes we do that. Sometimes we have to extrapolate because it's the only option. Right. And so, but what you have to remember is that, okay, I, I can do that, but I also need to add a note in my, in my report that says, Hey, I extrapolated here. So these results are less reliable than what I had before. Right. If you're interpolating, then you're working inside the range of your, your X's that you built your model on and you feel good about that. Right. Whereas if you're extrapolating, then you're going beyond the range and, and you have less reliable results. Okay. Um, there are instances where we have no choice, right? We have to extrapolate where we have no choice but to extrapolate, extrapolate to make a prediction. Okay. What happens then is that's, it's, you can do it, right? But if that's the case, then you have to make a note of it in your report, okay? So if that's the case, if that's the case, you must make a note of it in your report. With a warning that extrapolated results are less reliable than interpolated results, okay? With a warning that extrapolated results are less reliable than interpolated results. So it gets, it's a lot, right, to keep track of. Um, but as you go through these things, and you will probably come across a case where, okay, well, yeah, uh, I have to predict beyond the range of my data, but I, I don't have a choice here, right? I, I have to. They want a prediction. I don't, yeah. I've only built my model off of this data. So what, what it looks like, right, is you might have uh, your response variable, which is your Y variable, and then your explanatory variable here. Oops. And remember, uh, oh, here how you remember where, where they go, right, is the explanatory variable goes on the x-axis, right? So we're always trying to predict the response, okay? So what's the typical kind of uh, layout here? Well, I, I've identified my, the response variable, the one that I'm interested in learning more about. This is the variable of interest, right? The one I want to make predictions about or the one I want to know more about, okay? So first, first things first, right? I identify what's the response variable and what's the explanatory variable. 
And maybe I should set up these steps here. Step number one, identify the response and explanatory variable. in your data. Okay. So this is assuming that you already have data, right? Or uh, maybe you are collecting data, but that's not gonna be the case for you guys. You guys are gonna be handed data and then you have to identify the response and the explanatory variables. Okay. What's your, what's your next step? You'd have to plot the data, right? Using a scatter plot, Right, and so step two, plot the data in a scatter plot. Okay. Plotting the data, uh, my go-to is, let me make the dots a little bit bigger here. My go-to is something, you know, looks, Maybe something like that, okay? And maybe just to show, maybe like that, ha ha, okay? We see that there's a strong linear positive relationship here, right? So it, once you've plotted the data, what's the next step? Describe the relationship, right? What, what do you see here, okay? And so let's change my pen back. Step three is going to be describe the relationship. Right? And I'll say above, we have a strong positive linear relationship. because I, I made it that way, <laughs> okay? But that's, that's what I'm seeing here, okay? The fact that it's strong is good because it makes my predictions stronger, right? So uh, the, the strength and the direction, we can, uh, we can summarize numerically with the correlation, right? So here, can summarize this, can summarize the strength and direction numerically using the correlation, okay? What's, what's one thing that we didn't really pay attention to besides maybe, you know, a multiple choice question here or there, but the correlation only applies to a linear relationship, right? So we can summarize the strength and, and the direction of, an, of a linear relationship numerically using the correlation, right? But here, because I have a linear relationship, uh, I'm going to follow it up with correlation uh, only applies to linear relationships. Okay. You can calculate it for nonlinear relationships, but it's going to be low. Right, because it's, it's really only summarizing the strength and the direction, assuming a linear relationship, which isn't the case if you have, you know, some curvature in your data, for example, right? So that those, these are all things that we need to, need to remember and kind of add to our uh, just general library of information, right? So, um, in this course, we're going to talk about, okay, well, what happens if I have a nonlinear relationship? Then, then what are my options, right? But for now, let's focus on linear relationships because they're the most common. And spoiler alert, I think I've told you guys already, but spoiler alert, uh, even if you have a nonlinear relationship, our, our first tactic 
is to try to transform the data into a linear relationship. And then we can go on and we can use the, the normal things, right? And so then we're back to, okay, here we feel comfortable again, right? It makes the interpretation a little bit trickier, right? Because now I've transformed the data, I've changed it. So I can't just interpret the X and the Y variables as they are, um, but it, it does make the modeling easier. And so that's one of the options that we'll consider. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, once you've described the relationship, then your next step is going to be to model the relationship. Okay. So uh, even for me, uh, wrapping my head around the modeling can be a little bit tricky because what it does is uh, we, we ask, let's say R to do the model, to build the model, fit the linear model. LM command is what we use, so the linear model. And what it does is it goes through and it minimizes the distances from all of these points. So it picks the straight line. And so what you can imagine it doing maybe uh, instead of minimizing the residuals is you could think of it as going through and considering a series of different lines and then picking the one that minimizes uh, the residuals or the sum of the residuals. Okay. So then the fourth step is going to be build the model and we're gonna do this using software, right? And so for us, build the model We'll do it in both R and Python. We'll look at the different outputs, but what you're gonna see is they look the same or they're very similar. So once you've seen one, you've seen them all and then you'll be able to kind of uh, feel comfortable with Excel output or SPSS output or depending on what field you go into. Uh, market research, for example, they, uh, at the time that I was working in the field, they were really big on SPSS still, which is a statistical programming for the social sciences. Um, and it's like a click, 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 very tedious. Once you're used to programming and telling it exactly what you want, uh, you're going to start to to dislike the click, 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 click. Very annoying. Um, but you can program in SPSS, but it's kind of weird. But anyways, I digress. So depending on you know, what field you're heading into, uh, it, you're gonna be familiar with the output that they typically look at, okay? But you build the model, um, which you know, depending on the software is, you give it your X value, you give it your Y value or your X variable and your Y variable, and then it just goes through and it does it, okay? So in R, we use the LM command, which is linear model. And it, uh, it needs the Y variable and the X variable. And I'll say at minimum, We need to give the X variable and the Y variable. Okay. I, well, you saw me, I couldn't get into the textbook. I had other ways of getting there, but I haven't looked at the modeling, uh, the linear modeling in, in Python quite yet, but I suspect it's something similar because all it really needs is information on your X variable and information on your Y variable. And then what it will do is it'll minimize the sum of the residuals squared. Okay. The final model the final model that is output 
um, that is, I'll say produced, because I, I'm going to try to use output as the, the Y and input as the X. Okay, I'm going to try, try to, to stick to that. Okay, but the final model that is produced is the line that minimizes uh, the sum of the residuals squared. That's why it's called the least squares regression line. That minimizes the sum of the residuals squared. Now the residuals, remember is the distance between the observed and the predicted value. The residual, this is basically like a, a daisy chain of, of definitions that we need to remember, right? But, but it's good to have this overview because then we can kind of talk about it um, more intelligently later. So the residual is the distance Between, uh, between, I'll say an observed value, an observed value, which I'll say is Y subscript I, and the predicted value, Y I hat. Okay. What's assumed here is that it's at the exact same value of x at xi. Okay. And so the residual, usually we denote it by an e, because remember, if we used r, uh, r is the correlation, and so it was already taken. But also, uh, the residual is the error. So we can use the E instead. So EI, EI, makes me sound like a donkey. EI, EI. Anyways, EI is the residual. Is the observed YI minus the predicted. Uh, um, so anyways, uh, so, so the residual is the observed minus the predicted value at that same value of X. Okay? So each data point will have a residual. So therefore, each observation in our data set will have a residual. So we'll have a residual. Yeah. I know definitely in R, we can, um, if, we've, if we have fit the model, a linear model, then what we can do is we can also call up the residuals. So it stores uh, the residuals in there. And what I want to do for next day is uh, we're not going to be set up with Python quite yet. Uh, maybe I'll make that our lab. Maybe that's a good lab practice thing. Um, I need to figure out how. I know it's free, so I, I can do it. Um, but anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. But in R, um, if I have, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I can do it. We can do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, all right, there, I figured out what the lab for this week is going to be, getting you set up with Python, that'll be good. Um, anyways, so uh, each observation will have a residual, and so um, what you can do is you can 
recall the residuals from the linear model, and you can actually attach it if you want to see them attached to your data set, especially if you have a small enough data set, then it, it might be nice to see the residual. Um, and the reason that we want to see them, maybe, is because we do a lot of our um, kind of assumption checking, but also to see how appropriate our model is. So goodness of fit checking, we use our residuals. Okay? And so we didn't really do it in SAT 230 because it was you know, kind of rushed and, uh, and stuff like that. But, and we didn't really get to go into uh, to a lot of it very deeply for regression. So now what you're gonna find is that a huge portion of your analyses uh, that you don't get to put in your report, it'll sometimes it'll often go, you know, in an appendix somewhere where, hey, I actually did all this stuff. Uh, no one wants to see it in the report. Uh, <laughs> no one. Um, but at some point, you're going to have to go through and and check how well your model fits your data, right? How good of a job is your model doing? And what we do for a lot of those checks is we use the residuals, okay? And so uh, it sounds silly, but it, it's called goodness of fit, okay? And, and we've seen goodness of fit testing for chi-squareds, uh, but goodness of fit is kind of a broad term that we use. Uh, and in this case, we're talking about how well does our model fit our data, okay? Trying to think, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's one of those things that I'm like, there's a word, there's a word out there. It's right here, but it'll come to me. So um, we will use the residuals. And maybe this is part of our steps here. Remember I was going through steps, I almost forgot. Uh, but step number five might be Okay, so I'll hold off a little bit. Step number five would probably be graph the, the, the line, right? Graph the model that we fit on our scatter plot. It would be hard not to, right? Graph the, graph the line, graph the linear model we have found on the scatter plot. Okay. And make sure that it actually is modeling the behavior that you're seeing in your scatter plot. Otherwise, something went wrong. Some potential options, especially it, when you're just beginning, is maybe you've mixed up your x and your y's, right? And so uh, that's basically the only thing that can go wrong at this point. Um, but a computer is only as smart as, as you make it, right? So if you tell it to map the X value or the X variable as your Y value and your Y variable as your X value, uh, it'll, it's going to do that. And that's wrong, right? So you want to map it, uh, graph it, and make sure that it is actually, it looks like a reasonable model. Okay. So make sure <coughs> uh, your model is in fact modeling the relationship that you see. Modeling the relationship you see in your graph. Sorry, I've got oh, almost out of water too. <laughs> My throat's so dry, I don't know. Maybe it's the weather here. Mm -mm. But you wanna make sure that the model that you've applied uh, actually looks like what you have in your, uh, in your scatter plot. Okay, and so uh, some common 
or the only error that you might have made at this point is uh, make sure that you haven't mixed up your X and your Y variables. Right, so make sure you haven't mixed up your X and Y variables in your model. Okay. <clears throat> What you're going to find is that this is relatively easy, right? Fitting the model in R, even though it's not familiar to us and, and you know, we're just starting. But uh, once we get the hang of it, this part is, is the easy part, okay? It's everything that we need to remember to do around fitting the model. That's the hard part, okay? So <clears throat> once we've fit the model, we've added it to our scatter plot. It looks good. It looks like it's doing a reasonable job. I'm happy with this model. Now I have to assess the model fit. That's the, that's the phrase that was on the tip of my tongue. I did it, I did it. Um, okay, so six, assess the model fit. And usually what we do is uh, using a residual analysis. Using a residual analysis. Okay. Now we didn't do this in, in STAT 230 uh, because it's kind of, it's a little bit too far into regression, but this is what we will be doing. And this is what's going to consume a lot of your time. And this is the part where, okay, I did all these checks and, and I made sure that my model was good, but this is pretty much just due diligence on your part, right? If someone comes and checks and, and questions your model, then uh, you would present your residual analysis and say, hey, this model is good because look at this residual analysis. There's nothing wrong here. There's nothing going on here. And I say residual analysis, it's like the secret thing for now, and it's going to stay a secret thing, but it's a series of plots and calculations that we do. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, a lot of you have taken data science 300 with me or with Joe, or I, I don't know who else teaches that course, but uh, last term it was, it was me and Joe or Joe and I, sorry. Um, me, Joe and me, anyways, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but uh, the problem is we didn't get to go very deep into, so we, we saw so many topics and that's what's crazy about uh, data science 300 is we saw so much, uh, but we didn't really get to dig deep into anything, right? We just kind of, oh, here's a thing you can do. Oh, okay, crazy. Oh, okay. And then we moved on. Oh, here's another thing you can do. And then uh, here's how to do some of it. And then we kind of moved on, right? And so we're going to go into uh, in deeper to some of those territories. Of course, we can't get into all of them, right? But I'm going to focus on uh, linear regression and, and logistic regression, right? So if you've taken 300, uh, you'll have heard about logistic regression, but might not have done it. Okay? And that's that's okay. That's totally fine. But I want to assume that we're all just starting fresh. I mean, we had a, a, a Christmas break, so that's when I used to forget everything. <laughs> Maybe I still do. Um, but anyway, so we're going to assess the model fit using a residual analysis. Okay, and so a residual analysis is going to be a prescribed set of graphs that we look at, but also some calculations that we can do. And <clears throat> there's kind of a core set that we do, and sometimes we might uh, if there's something a little bit concerning, we might look at some other graphs. Okay. 
And so a residual analysis A residual analysis is a, 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 I'm going to say a prescribed series of graphs or a prescribed series of graphs and calculations. to help ensure that our model is reliable, right? Because every, all the predictions, remember if we go back to the purpose of regression, all our predictions, well, they're assuming that our model is reliable, right? If you're looking at a model and just in theory, if it's kind of all over the place and the predictions aren't very strong, Right, you're not going to take that uh, to maybe the bank and say, "Oh yeah, put all my invest all my money in this one crazy stock because I've predicted that it's going to do this." But then you look at your model and the model's not sure. Right, that's bad. So, uh, so I want you to kind of think of it as due diligence. Right, um, kind of making sure that you're prepared to argue how good your model is using your residual analysis, but you would never include it in the report because people that you're reporting to, they don't care. They assume that you've done this. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so residual analysis, and maybe I forgot some words here. I see that happens a lot, but sometimes I catch them and sometimes I don't. Uh, is a I think it's because I, I have the thought, so it only happens when I'm presenting like this. I have the thought and I say it out loud and then I that's like two out of three and I forget to write it down. A residual analysis is a prescribed series of graphs and calculations um, that help us determine whether a model is reliable or not. So that help us determine whether a model is reliable or not. Okay. Uh, consider the residual analysis as part of uh, your, your due diligence before presenting a model, right? Is it reliable or can I stand by this model, um, right? Or is it kind of flaky and it, it's all over the place and I don't feel comfortable with my result, right? Then, then you could say that because of the residual analysis, right? But if you're presenting a model, then you should feel good about your model, right? And so the residual analysis is part of that support, right? So consider the residual analysis as part of your due diligence in terms of supporting your model or supporting the use of your model maybe. but it would never be included uh, in your report. But we would never include it And the reason I'm highlighting this is because it would take up so much of your report and your client would stop reading after the second page and be like, why do I, I don't care about this. Uh, so we do include it in the appendix. So we would never include it as part of our report, but it would be included 
in an appendix. Right, somewhere in your submission. Right. So your client is assuming that you've done this, right? They, they are assuming that you're not presenting a model that you don't feel comfortable with, right? And so that's something to keep in mind. Because um, the, the temptation when we first start uh, making reports and all, all our, our analyses, right, is that, oh yeah, I did all these things. I did all these crazy things and I tried it all and I, you know, I poked around and I did this and I did this. And at the end of the, of the day, your client doesn't care about that. They just want, okay, what's your prediction, basically, right, if that's the goal. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, once you have your model fit, there are other things that we can do, but once you have a model and you're comfortable with your model fit, then you can go ahead and you can make predictions, right? There are other things that we could keep doing, but in broad terms, in terms of what we saw in SAT 230, and we didn't even see the residual analysis. Um, I think I, I mentioned it, but we never did anything with it or anything like that. So we will now, okay? But once you've assessed the model fit and you feel comfortable with your model, then you can make predictions. Okay, so step number seven is use the model to make predictions. Okay. So you apply your model and your model would look something like this, right? Y hat is B0 plus B1 X. The predicted value of Y y hat is the predicted value of y, right? So the predicted value is the hat, uh, and then the predicted value of y is y hat. b naught is the intercept, sorry, the y-intercept. Of course, uh, let's see here. Do I have a different color? Blue, maybe. tealy blue. Uh, B1 is the slope. And then X is your input variable. Or explanatory variable. Yeah. What we didn't talk about, and I'll start introducing um, more later, but what we didn't really talk about in STAT 230 is that, okay, well, this is, this is a model based off of my sample. This is the, the equivalent of a statistic, right? So X bar, for example, right? And, but what am I really trying to do? Well, I'm trying to learn about mu, right? So in that same sense, I'm using this uh, model that I built on the sample that I have, because that's all the information that I have, but this model isn't gonna perfectly model um, the population, right? But the end goal is to try to model the population. Okay. The end goal is to, um, to estimate the model for the population. Population, which we often use We'll often use a capital Y, you can use a lowercase y if you want, but Y 
is beta naught plus beta one times X. And sometimes you'll see an error term on there and sometimes you won't. Uh, I'm gonna leave it on or off for now um, because it, it's gonna get too, too weird too fast, okay? But for now, uh, the end goal, just remember that really what we're trying to do is not just model our sample. We can, we can look at our sample and we can know everything about our sample. That's not the point. The point is to be able to look at our sample and learn something about the population, right? Okay, so if I predict this value from the sample, then what might it be in the population, right? It would be something uh, similar to that with error bounds. Yeah. So <clears throat> with my last couple of moments here, uh, Remember the, the y-intercept by definition is what? The y-intercept is the predicted value of y and uh, I'll focus on the B0 version here. It's the predicted value of y, oops. when x is zero. Okay. So that's a good refresher on the definition of the y-intercept. And right, notice that y hat is b0, the intercept, plus b1 times x. But when x is zero, then what happens? y hat is b, b0. Right, so y hat is b0 plus b1x. But if I let x be 0, then y hat is b0, b0. Let's start calling it properly. Right, b0, but x is 0. So the definition of the y-intercept is in that equation that we use. We just need to, to kind of think about it for a little bit. And uh, what's fun about kind of a, a second go around with all these things is, of course, you know, you might remember that I said all these things in Stat 230, but it's hard if it's the first or even the second or probably even the third time that you're hearing it, it still feels discombobulated, right? So my, my hope is that when you hear it now, it starts to kind of feel a little bit more obvious, right? And so that's, that's my goal. So I am definitely gonna review a lot, right? but that's how we learn. So then the slope, just to finish us off here, which is our B1 in, in the above case. Well, what's the slope? If we look at our, our equation that we're working with here. Well, that's gonna be for each unit increase in X, we will see a slope increase in the predicted value of y. I see it's kind of lagging here. Too much time on the internet, maybe. I don't know. Um, so it is uh, for each unit increase in x, we expect to see a slope increase in the predicted value of y. Now it gets weird if the slope is negative, right? But then if you have a negative three increase, that is still a decrease, right? So if you, if you wanna get fancy and use the word decrease, you'd have to drop the negative. Right, because a negative three decrease is actually a three increase. So you wanna be really careful. So for me, I, I tend to just stick with this notation or this, this wording, I guess, even if the slope is negative, because that way I, I know I'm not making a mistake. Right? You don't wanna uh, trip up there. Okay, 
So basically just a review of all kinds of terminology here, but also kind of guiding you through uh, the first few steps of linear modeling. Um, I think that's good for today. And I am pretty sure class is over. Um, let me just confirm. It is. Uh, <laughs> I have to get used to my new schedule. Anyways, um, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll uh, I'll see you on Thursday. Stop this here.